In this video, we'll be talking about page two of Laruelle's A Biography of Ordinary Man. But first, before we proceed, we have to um, go back to a problem that was left unresolved in the preceding video. Um, and that is the theoretical justification and meaning of the five theorems that he presents on, on page one. So I attempted uh, a preliminary justification in terms of uh, the leap into the new language and the impossibility of having a uh, hundred percent uh, pure new language. But uh, perhaps a better uh, justification comes from taking at his word the clue that Laruelle gives us when he insists on the um, word science to describe uh, his enterprise. So if we take his enterprise um, as science, we can uh, see more clearly that what he's doing is he's taking philosophy as uh, a proto-science. It's sort of always giving itself the goal of finally becoming or being a science one day, or sometimes it even pretends already to be a science. And um, taking the human sciences as um, empirical sciences, but he's going to call that in, into question in the rest of this section. And so we can take philosophy and the human sciences as uh, the base level or the um, observational sciences, observation um, in a, as wide a sense as we can give it, um, furnishing uh, the or providing us with the observation language. And um, Laruelle's uh, science of man, of ordinary man, is um, the new uh, theoretical science and with a new theoretical language. So uh, the old fashioned empiricist way of seeing the relation between the observation language uh, or languages and uh, the theoretical language of the new science is a sort of um, trickle up, if you can trickle upwards, it's a sort of seeping upwards, it's a, a layer cake model. You have um, the observation language, which is empirical and so is um, meant to be pretty stable and um, can fill around with it a little, but basically that's uh, supposedly well established. And the new theoretical language is to be interpreted in terms of um, the observational language, the new theoretical terms receive their interpretation from the observation language. So there's a problem uh, with that. And that is, if you're trying to get a change in paradigm, that is to say, a radical revision of uh, our theories, then uh, the observation language that interprets uh, the new uh, ideas is going to um, function as an obstacle to new meanings. So it's not just stable, it's um, entrenched. It's um, the authoritative language, the language of authorities, and uh, based on um, what everybody recognizes as experience. So you're never going to be able to really change your paradigm. So uh, the observation language is entrenched as a language of the authorities. This is a uh, Laruelle's point. It's the point of m much philosophy of science, but Laruelle is in fact in this chapter uh, being um, totally situated in the 
French epistemological tradition of uh, Bachelard, Conguillem, Cavaillers, and Althusser, and also Foucault. Um, but he's not using any specific connoted sense of um, theoretical, epistemological, or methodological terms. There, he's trying to sort of keep um, neutral. So he's not really using um, Bachelardian terms, and he's not using Popperian terms, although we can find lots of agreement with uh, Karl Popper and the people like Lakatosh um, and Kuhn and Feyerabend that followed him. But he's using uh, um, a fairly neutral vocabulary to talk about these um, problems. So um, any proposed alternative on that model, the, the basic layer cake model, where you have the observations, um, you have sort of uh, slightly more abstract uh, theorizations of the observations and of the instrumentation that's used to get the observations. And then you have, after um, several levels or a leap, you have the high theoretical level. So um, Lowell's point is that the language of minorities has been constructed on the basis of interpreting its terms by means of the observation language. So um, to get a radically new um, alternative paradigm, uh, Larouel suggests that we should uh, invert the procedure. This is what he um, already says in uh, the foreword. We start with the absolute, with the ordinary man, with um, minorities or the one. They're all when properly understood uh, synonyms for Laruel. So we start with that new term, or the old terms with a new meaning, so we can call them new terms, and um, we interpret downwards. Instead of interpreting upwards from the entrenched so-called observation language, we're interpreting downwards. So that's why um, he says that the human sciences are empirical, because they're based on um, uh, the sort of observations that we can make without calling uh, established paradigms into question. And why, one of the reasons why he says his science is uh, non-empirical. So that leads me to reconsider the five human theorems on page one. So on that sense, in that sense, on that interpretation, the key um, theorems are one and five. So he's going to make a counter-inductive, counter-intuitive, counter-empirical, in that sense of empirical, which he's going to later claim is constructed and pseudo-empirical. So it has to make um, a counter-inductive leap. And the leap is directly to man as the absolute, man as the real. So that's one. Man really exists and he's really distinct from the world. That's his leap. And he emphasizes that it's counter-inductive and counter-intuitive. That is to say, in contradiction with established uh, interpretations established languages of observation. This thesis contradicts almost all of philosophy. So we discussed the almost last time. He's allowing for um, uh, glimpses and glances and sketches of um, this leap within other philosophies. In fact, um, everything we've read up to now and probably for a long way to come, is totally compatible with uh, uh, Deleuze's philosophy when rightly understood. So he's going to say, um, by implication at least, that Deleuze uh, was okay, he was on the right track, but he um, 
he said a lot of crap as well. I mean, it was idle discussion. It was um, examples that are useless. He was quoting lots of other people. And so he was distracted from the main task. And sometimes he did it. Sometimes he made a leap. And sometimes he was uh, mired in um, all the um, uh, other stuff that we need to uh, list for the interim, maybe for a long time, do we have to cut away because um, it's dragging us back to uh, the um, entrenched observation language. Uh, Deleuze may be powerful enough to see all that in the new terms, but um, his disciples um, to a large part certainly are not. And Deleuze himself may be induced into error some of the time. So in a way, um, uh, he, Larwell is trying to uh, protect what is um, uh, the most real in uh, Deleuze's philosophy. So he's uh, willing to say that um, almost all the philosophy didn't make the leap, but maybe some part of some philosophy did make the leap. Okay, that's the first leap that um, the new object, man, as really existing. The other leap is in number five that um, a rigorous science of ordinary man, that is of man, is possible. So we make the leap, there's a new object, and we make a second leap that uh, a science, um, a unary science, because he doesn't like unified and unitary and so on, so his word later on will be unary. Um, uh, a science of uh, ordinary man is possible. So those two uh, leaps go together. We're getting humanity and rigor in what is, uh, in fact, um, one and the same leap. And the other um, theorems highlight the fact that uh, a leap must be made and that um, the leap is what is leaving behind, at least conceptually, the entrenched observation language, I'm calling it, um, the entrenched uh, language of the authorities is maybe a better way because it's not real observation, um, but it's functioning like the observation language, the observational basis. So um, the real human is mystical and contemplative and um, in the world of the authorities yeah, of the entrenched language we have um, action and practice and philosophy and we have the destiny in terms of um, these concepts that ultimately go back to um, the Greek origins of our thought of world, history, language, sexuality and power. So they're um, the two sides of this um, methodological, in terms of scientific methodological account that we have the entrenched views and we uh, need to make the uh, counterinductive, counter intuitive uh, leap in order to get to uh, a new way of thinking or a new paradigm. So he continues on page two, such a, a description, a theoretically justified description of the life of ordinary man um, is the objective of this Treatise. We also talked about theoretical justification and uh, a similar point is made there. Why can he consider himself um, as making a theoretical justification of uh, his new description? He's discarding the approach that was too classical and too empiricist, in fact, that um, he describes in the foreword for uh, his first breakthrough book, 
the principle of minority, and he said that the book was um, too much of a mixture and too pedagogical. So it's pedagogical because it starts at the um, the base level, that is to say philosophy, and it tries to take us to the um, Larowellian science level, progressively or by mixed means. So um, his new um, technique or strategy in this book is, uh, in contrast to pedagogical, we can call it didactic. In the um, uh, forward, he says the book is a, a manual and a compendium of arguments. So that's the didactics. The didactics starts from the new idea and then tries to show what the um, previously observed or accepted um, observations and ideas can be viewed as, can be revisioned as, in the light of um, the new science. So um, if you're constantly justifying in terms of this um, bottom-up model, model, there's a limit, let's put it here, you'll never get to the new paradigm. If um, your um, theoretical justification is in terms of the reasons of um, the paradigm itself and its way of analysing the observations and the accepted ideas, there's not the same limit. You jump to the new paradigm and then you can look at everything. Some of it you'll just discard. So maybe there's a limit there in that um, there'll be loss. Some things will no longer make sense. Some things uh, you won't be able to explain anymore because you're obliged to reject them or replace them or make them disappear. So there's a sort of um, folk philosophy and the human sciences become um, to that extent folk theories and sometimes you just can't um, transvalue them. You, they, there's a, a disappearance of um, some core folk ideas that has to be uh, effectuated. So you have to disappear them. Um, in the next paragraph, uh, Larawell says, in the form in which they exist and triumph, the sciences of man are not sciences and have nothing uh, to do with man. So once again, it's this um, two legs or whatever approach. You have to walk on two legs in his world. So um, you need um, uh, the rigor of science and the humanity of man or of the human. Um, and he's saying in philosophy and in the sciences of man that stem, or the human sciences, that stem from philosophy, there's no science, and uh, uh, not in a real sense, and there's no man, not in the sense of the real object, man. So he's quite um, Popperian at this point. The human sciences for Laruel, as for Popper, are pseudosciences. Um, Laruel doesn't use that word of pseudoscience, he calls them later on fake sciences. But it's the same idea and for some of the same reasons. So they're um, pseudosciences and um, as well we can also see an Althusserian influence. There's the real object and the theoretical object in one phase of Althusser's work. And the real object for Laruel is man, a new continent, but we'll get to that in a little while. And um, the sciences of man, 
have nothing to do with man. They uh, um, have to do with a panoply of theoretical objects, and they never get to um, man as such. So um, he says, in question here is not their conflict with philosophy, or the fact, he says it's a fact, that they lack precise empirical procedures, but he's not going to um, enter into that debate, he says. I think he does um, go on um, a lot more about um, the lack of empirical procedures. The conflict with philosophy, he just downplays. It's not a real conflict uh, for him uh, because um, the human sciences don't uh, effectuate the rupture. They don't break away in any real sense from philosophy. Um, so he says, instead, we attack the globally non-scientific character of these second-hand sciences. So once again, they're non-scientific, they're pseudo-scientific or fake sciences, and they're second-hand because um, the theoretical base, the base language um, and the base concepts are all derived from, uh, from philosophy and the Greek way of thinking. And they do not form a science and they do not relate to any real object. So we come back uh, again to the um, quasi-Althusserian point, although obviously Lara Weyl uh, transvalues Althusser as well, that um, basically human sciences are ideology. They're pseudosciences and um, they're functioning in the interests of uh, the authorities. So he's not going to defend philosophy against the human sciences. And he says, it's an interesting quote, should the father be defended against his children or should he be left to die? Instead, we defend a man against this authoritarian family in league against him. So it's interesting to point out the um, anti-Oedipus uh, allusion or at least the resonance there. We said already that in the forward there was a, an anti oedipal ring to some of the affirmations, the idea of getting away from the um, intimate drama and um, the idea, what was the other anti oedipal idea? Um, just the, the Nietzschean idea that it's, um, it's attempts and it's working on the paths of of imminence. So um, here he's diagnosing um, in the revolts that he mentions on page one, in the revolts against um, uh, philosophy and in the counter revolts in defense of philosophy, um, he's uh, diagnosing an Oedipal or familiarist uh, um, dimension. So it's an authoritarian family, the whole lot, the father and the sons and daughters or philosophy and the human sciences. And he wants to um, not defend the son or defend the father. He wants to defend man, the real object that has nothing to do with these um, pseudoscientific uh, constructs. So he, he Pies it on or more with man has never been the object of the sciences of man. So the sciences of man don't have man as object. And we get um, a reflection on the um, plural title or the implications of the plural title that we discussed in the last video for section one from the sciences of man to the science of man, or no, to the science of men or uh, better as translated here, to the science of people. So um, the sciences of man, according to Laruel, combine the plural and the singular in a strange way. So either we have man exists 
and um, we have lots of different sciences, multiple sciences, to try to uh, take man as an object, but man uh, is too inexhaustible as existing. And so these sciences um, don't really exist. They're attempts at sciences. Or there's a hypothesis that comes with um, the anti-humanism that comes up with um, structuralism. And that is that um, man does not exist and only sciences or methods exist. So um, one idea of um, this structuralist approach is that you have a, um, a multiplicity of universal pre predicates that by their um, uh, convergence and overlap um, uh, have as a point of convergence um, in, the, in the long term man as a a unitary object. So we've got this multiplicity when we're supposedly um, trying to analyze man and under this in a way we're saying well we'll have a full account of man at the end of the um, lines of convergence but this full account will um, uh, dissipate man into um, the full set of accumulated predicates that we need to take account of the ph phenomenon that was previously called man. So this is a disappearance theory of man. Um, and we talked about um, uh, Laruel himself practicing a uh, type of uh, disappearance theory. But he's going to disappear man in the um, ordinary um, ideological sense, but say that there is a, a real object man um, over and above or outside all this. So man in that sense of the human sciences becomes totally indeterminate and you determine the content of the concept of man by accumulating all these universal predicates coming from these um, supposedly universal sciences that um, in fact uh, contradict each other. So um, we have a, a similar phenomenon in a way in, um, in physics. We don't have, well, I suppose we have a multiplicity of theories, but we have two big paradigms. The um, paradigm of general re relativity and the paradigm of uh, quantum mechanics. And a lot of effort has been um, put into trying to find the point of convergence or the line of convergence or the field of convergence between these two theories and to create um, a unified theory of um, the world. So, uh, so far, not so good. Um, Laruel is making a similar point that uh, we're tending towards a unified uh, field theory of man in the accumulation of the human sciences, but we're not getting there. And he, in that sense, is saying, if you make the sort of leap of taking man as a real object, that's the solution. We'll get a, a unified, in scare quotes, because he doesn't like that word, a unified field theory or a unified theory of, of man. Um, but in the meantime, we're stuck in a quandary where Either man has this inexhaustible, but not in the real sense, um, uh, excludes the human sciences as not being sciences, or the sciences, 
taken as um, real sciences, exclude in their anti-humanism man. The principles of constitution of um, both um, objects, if you will, man the object, the phantasmatic object, but still man as the object, and um, human sciences as sciences, phantasmatic sciences, but still called sciences. The principle according, this is the uh, logical point that Larawell is making, the principle um, uh, principles of constitution of these two entities are mutually exclusive. So you need something else. You need um, a, a counterinductive uh, leap. Here he says, and this is the leap, perhaps the arrangement should be inverted. If science is to cease to be a techno-political fantasy, so it's um, it's not really um, abstract theoretical, um, he's talking about the human sciences, it's not really an abstract uh, theoretical uh, discipline, it's more technical and technological than really abstract, and so closer to the entrenched observation language, and uh, it's political as well. Human sciences are political in the service of um, the authorities. So, if science is to be uh, is to cease to be a techno techno political fantasy and become a real science, it must be unique and specific. So, um, none of this fiddling around, accumulating predicates, which in fact um, are incommensurable predicates, and so uh, by that very um, principle of construction, exclude man as um, a one, as a ob real object. So we need a unique and specific science. Unique, just one, and specific, specific to man as a real object, and not introducing all sorts of other um, considerations. It is man who must be irreducible in his multiplicity. So it's no use just multiplying the sciences. Um, because we can uh, ask for the theoretical justification of this multiplicity if you're trying to do the sciences of man. Why do you need all these different sciences? So um, the multiplicity, which is an important value for Lowell, um, is um, for him firmly um, anchored in the essence of man. Um, and so, sort of concluding on this sort of reasoning, uh, Larawell um, comments that we have a double poverty of the sciences of man. So, um, we know the double poverty is ultimately no science and no man, but um, he says, as concerns science, they admit either to an indeterminate plurality plurality, or else to the mineral unity of a nebula. Okay, this is rather obscure. What's he mean? What's this, um, the indeterminate plurality um, we can understand quite easily. That's um, the um, man is indeterminate and requires a plurality of universal predicates. And even that is um, uh, indeterminate because we don't know how many universal predicates uh, we'll need how many um, uh, sciences and sub-sciences and sub-hypotheses uh, will we need to get to man. In fact, this is Larwell's point, we can never get to man, we can never converge on man uh, for two reasons. Man, as defined by the human sciences, is ultimately, um, in terms of the foundation, totally indeterminate. And man as um, uh, the real object is totally inaccessible to that sort of um, uh, way of proceeding. So that's the internal determinant of plurality. We can understand that. Um, and then he um, says, so this pseudoscience is either in um, reduced to indeterminate plurality 
or to the mineral unity of a nebula. So the mineral unity um, is, well, it's still a nebula, so there's a, a plurality there. Um, but it's, why is a mineral? Um, I think the easiest way to uh, see that is the indeterminate plurality is um, science as a cloud. So in fact, it's fuzzy, it's, it's gaseous. And the um, only other possibility is some hard and sharp um, reductive, reductionist, um, crystallized idea as the, um, of man. You um, crystallize, congeal, mineralize this pl plurality either as an extrapolation or as a sort of dogmatic uh, a reduction just to one thing. Yes, we have all these um, pluralities, but the base uh, science for man is such and such. I don't know. Um, political science, economics, psychoanalysis, whatever. So that would be the mineral unity of a nebula. So he concludes, either way, they reveal that they are nothing but an artifact, the foam that the wave of other sciences left on the terra incognita of man. So I think this is a, a blow, or a critique, um, a blow to uh, Foucault's idea that man is just a, a face drawn in the sand and with the um, with special um, um, specific conditions of um, constitution and now with the structuralist uh, human sciences man is just fading away. So um, Larawell is saying yeah sure that's true man as constituted by this whole um, Greco philosophic and scientific tradition is fading away. It was always um, uh, predestined to fade away, but um, that's on, on your sand. But there's a whole other continent, a new continent, a terra incognita, that is the continent of man. So man fades there, but the real object man um, is only just coming into view. So um, that's one of the points of um, presence in this um, a whole argument that the presence of Foucault is there and it's interesting to see um, that Foucault died in 1984 this book came out in 1985 at the same time um, in 1985 um, Deleuze um, had finished at the end of 1984 his four years of seminar on uh, the cinema and was going to do a seminar on what is philosophy, but he abandoned temporarily or permanently, I don't know, that project to um, uh, do a, a year uh, a year seminar on um, uh, Foucault in 1985 and then to publish the book Foucault in 1986. So uh, Larawell is um, within his rights to say that um, Foucault is backward looking when he talks about the death of man. He's looking at the whole, which is already good to be able to survey a whole uh, um, 2000 year or more tradition, but Foucault, uh, but it's not enough. So Foucault uh, was backward looking. He didn't make the leap into the new continent. And Deleuze, who should have made the leap into the new continent, and maybe did to a certain extent, is anyhow um, half-hearted. So um, in his um, Foucault book, from Larouel's point of view, we could say that Deleuze is still looking backwards and is not making the leap that um, Larouel extrapolates 
from Deleuze's work, saying this is um, what uh, Deleuze has been trying to do with his um, uh, theorization of imminence. This is where he uh, is going or was going, and this is what he should have done. Um, but maybe he did, but it's too confused with all the um, idle discussion, or maybe he didn't even uh, ultimately do it. So Laurel is saying, um, these others are good, Deleuze and Foucault, I learned a lot from them, but they didn't make the leap that I'm making now. And um, that's sort of uh, condemning um, a part of Deleuze, at least, to um, this status that he discusses in the, in the foreword of um, sketches and programs. That is to say, of a, a manif manifesto-like um, quality. And just to, to finish, I would like to read from uh, Rhizome. So this is the book Rhizome that was rewritten a little and included as a first chapter of um, anti, no, of a thousand plateaus. So this little book came out in 1975, and it ends, this is near the end of the um, version that's in A Thousand Plateaus, but they add a little. But uh, I'll just read the end. Um, write to the nth power, or to n minus one. Write by slogans. Make rhizomes and not roots. Never plant. Don't um, uh, sow, but um, graft. Uh, don't be either one or multiple, B multiplicities, Larawell would agree with that point. Um, uh, make uh, uh, lines and, and not points, and never points. Um, speed transforms the point into the line. Be uh, uh, rapid, be quick, um, even on the spot. A line of chance, a line of the hips, a line of flight. Uh, don't um, uh, erect a general in you, um, make uh, maps and not photos or um, drawings, be the pink row, uh, the pink panther, and that let your uh, loves um, be uh, again like the wasp and the orchid, the cat and the baboon. So that's a, a pretty um, uplifting incantation, but it's not the real thing. It's not doing the work. One can argue um, that um, a fair bit of Deleuze is um, incantatory, that is, he'll do work and then sort of transform it into incantations and um, uh, then work and you know, um, sort of um, make programmatic uh, announcements. And uh, Laruel is, um, similarly to his objection to Foucault, he's saying, um, but in the other direction, Foucault, he's accusing of looking backwards um, and not seeing the new continent that we can um, uh, leap to. Can we leap to a new continent? And um, uh, Deleuze, for Laruel is partially looking backwards and partially um, making a little too many proclamations and uh, manifestos and needs to be kept on track. And uh, one of the things Laruel is going to do is keep all these theorists on, on track and actually um, uh, do the work of um, leaping to the new paradigm and working out in detail um, how things uh, can be seen and understood um, from actually within the new paradigm.